This is the seventh message I preached this year. And we've been through the prophets, right? And the prophets had a message for God's people in, a, in times of need, in times of despair. God would raise up prophets to speak to his people. Now, there's this prophet called Jeremiah who spoke in a really tough time. And Jeremiah sometimes felt like the people were not listening. And he even argued with God and said, God, why are you telling me to say all these things? That, they don't even care. And he would argue with God and he would cry with God. And, and sometimes it feels like we have a mission to accomplish. But sometimes when you believe in God, you go through trials and tribulations and testing of your faith. When it feels like maybe God is not on it, but sometimes the obstacles and the trials are proof that God is on it, right? Right? And so, not every time that God sends you to do something, it will be easy. In fact, I would argue that every time is not going to be easy. Uh, in this world, you will have trouble, right? Jesus said. And so, we're in this journey of prophetic books and just snippets of the, of the prophets speaking to Israel. And, and last time I preached, two weeks ago, I preached to you about Haggai and how he um, encouraged people to rebuild the temple. How he said, hey listen, you're building your homes, but you're, you're neglecting God's house. And if you put God's house first, he'll take care of you. Like you are too obsessed about your own personal success that you've neglected the very thing that can give you success in life. Amen. If you put not only God first, but if you allow God to give you the list of priorities for your life, he will align everything to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in you. And see, sometimes the misunderstanding as Christians is, or when we come to Christ, we think, oh, now I believe in God, so I'm going to put God first, and then I'm going to tell him to bless the rest of my list of priorities. And we say, you know, God, I love you, but man, I want the healing, I want the provision, I want this job, I want this thing. And what I argued for uh, uh, last time I preached, I said, you need to get rid of your priorities list. Like, it, it's all or nothing. You need to say, God, I don't have a list of priorities. You give me what you want to be first in my life. Of course it's you, but then give me the rest of things that you have in store for me. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, his plans are better than my plans. And so if we pursue his list of priorities for our life, then our next task is to seek and, and try to find our gifts and talents in order for us to accomplish the things that he has called us to accomplish, right? And so Zechariah is where we're going to be at today. Zechariah comes in a time where people are already kind of building, but they have to maintain what, they're, uh, what they started. And so this verse is very well known. It says, so he said to me, and we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll explore verse 1 through 14 all along the, this, this message. But this is the, the, the focus of, of the passage. This is what the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, uh, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm going to read it again. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The title of the message is, Carry Out the Mission. I've been living in Milan for about uh, 17 years, like February, I think February 2nd or 3rd of 2003, I arrived to Midland. With just a suitcase and some friends and some crazy things in mind that uh, I didn't know God would change all that to do what he wanted to do, right? Like I never in my dreams wanted to preach or be on a stage preaching. Um, to be honest with you, this is just between you and me, okay? I, I was a bass player for about 10 years. I loved music. I loved playing my bass. I didn't like talking to people. Don't tell anybody, okay? Because I pastor a church. <laughs> and my church may get offended by it, but I like people now. <laughs> Most of them. <laughs> Just kidding. But in those 17 years, I've seen this town change. And uh, one of the things that happens in Midland is that since there's not much to do, 
we have a lot of restaurants to go to, right? And so uh, along the years, they've been opening new restaurants and new restaurants. And there was this burger place that opened up, I don't know, 10 years ago. I don't know. I lost track of time. But I just remember that when they opened it, like it was packed. I don't know if that still happens because uh, I, honestly, I don't go for the grand openings of many things. Now I wait until, you know, it, it's, you know, normal, right? Uh, but <clears throat> I remember this place was packed. And second day was packed, and third day was packed, and fourth day was packed. And after a few weeks, when it slowed down a little bit, uh, we enjoyed going there because food was really good. The place was clean. Uh, uh, The customer service was outstanding. Like, everything had quality. But after a few months, (laughs) (laughs) seems like that happened quicker now than it used to be. They couldn't keep up with it, right? They couldn't maintain the place clean. They couldn't maintain the customer service. They couldn't maintain the food quality. They couldn't maintain what they had started. And I don't know about you, but along the years, I've learned to appreciate more someone that can maintain something than someone that can start something. Because it's easy to get excited and start and have all dreams and have all ideas and have plans and gather friends and gather investors and go all in. And then after opposition comes, after the trial comes, so many people give up. And I don't know about you, but even in our Christian walk, it's easy to go all in at the beginning and say, oh God. I came to you and you answer, right? You healed me, you provided, you opened the door, you gave me. And then suddenly the fire to maintain his presence with us goes down. And we don't maintain what we started. And so Haggai inspired people to start building, to shift their focus from themselves into what really mattered. He said, you need to stop building your home and start building God's house. But Zacharias' um, calling was to help people maintain the momentum, right? You need someone that can carry out the mission. That can maintain the the level of excellence. The level of pursuit for the things that really matter. And so this was Zechariah. And Zechariah reminds us that God provides the resources for us to do his work. Yes, what God is calling you and me to do is beyond our abilities. Is beyond sometimes even our gifts and our talents and our resources. But what God calls you to do, he promises to provide For you to accomplish what you are supposed to accomplish by his spirit. Does that make sense? Like the calling is great. You are called to be light in this world. You are called to be different in this world. You are called to set an example of forgiveness in this world. You are called to set an example of love in this world. You are called to set an example of commitment in this world. You are called to set up an example of faithfulness in this world. Is it easy? No, because everybody around us is giving up. They give up on relationships, they give up on parenthood, they give up on school, they give up on jobs, they give up on the quality of my hamburger when I go to that place, they, <laughs> they give up on church. But we're called to maintain, right? To pursue. And that was Zachariah's job and today is kind of a different vision Sunday. Because this is one where we will be reminded and encouraged by the fact that God not only calls us to serve, but he equips us to fulfill that call. And sometimes it takes time. And sometimes it takes opposition. And sometimes it takes obstacles. But we live in a world where we want everything quick. And I just want to tell you that we are here to stay as the gathering we're here to stay in fact we've been staying because many of you have been faithful throughout the years through the obstacles through the challenges through the opposition thank you for your faithfulness to this church thank you for your commitment to God's presence in this church my prayer is that I can be the leader that God called me to be 
But we're here to stay for the long run. God's call to service always. Can you say always? Always. God's call to service always comes with a promise. Can you say promise? Promise. Of help to carry out the mission. He calls us, all of us, to serve him. Now, I'm always emphasizing that the service is beyond the church. Of course, you are supposed to serve the church, but you're also supposed to serve him where you work, where you study, where you handle relationships with your family, when you take your children to the soccer game, everywhere you're supposed to serve him, right? Amen. And you have the promise of help from the living God to carry out your mission. This week, as I said, before we left on Monday, on Friday, we went to a marriage retreat and seminar. And, and so we spent two nights at a hotel with, uh, with, with several couples. We had a fantastic time. Then we came home for church. And then, uh, and then the next day, we left again. And after a few days, even when you're out of town, you kind of like miss home, don't you? You miss your bed. I, I was looking forward to sleeping on my own bed. But I stayed up too late laboring through this message that two of my kids bit me to my bed. So <laughs> maybe tonight. <laughs> Israel wanted to be back home. They had been in exile. They had been scattered, left without a home, and, and their exile period has come to an end. And Zechariah is saying, listen, you are coming back to your own town. And God is using a Gentile king to allow you to come back to your town because they were still under the ruling of a different king, not a, not a, not a Jewish king, but a, but a Persian king that, that said, you can come back to your land and okay, I'll grant you permission because God will use whoever he wants in order to accomplish his purposes in your life. Sometimes he uses the boss you don't like. <laughs> Sometimes he uses the friend you don't like. Sometimes he uses things that you don't even know that, that God is using in order to accomplish his purposes in your life. Now if God is not using your boss on your behalf. Maybe God is using you on someone else's behalf. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. We are all instruments in his hands. He will accomplish what he will accomplish. The question is will we get on his side or not? Will we trust him with his plans or not? Will we rely on his sufficiency or not? Right? And so the calling today is to maintain what we start. And so uh, Israel uh, is, is given several prophecies. Uh, we read in Isaiah on the first week uh, of this year. I said, you know, Isaiah said, you know, it's been bad. There's been sin. But now, but now there's a new beginning. There is forgiveness. Like the penalty of your sin has been paid for. You are free. God, has, uh, God is, is, is setting a new path for you. In the middle of the wilderness, God has a new plan for you. And Isaiah gets them really excited. And he says, you have a future. You have hope. You have a land. You have a promise. God is restoring everything that has been lost. But it seems to me that people kind of like maybe after these grand and hope-filled prophetic pronouncements of a glorious restoration uh, ran into a wall when they came back and they faced opposition. I wish once you come to Christ, you wouldn't have to cry anymore. I wish you wouldn't have to face opposition anymore. I wish the sickness would go away right away, right? I get somewhat troubled by statements that tell you that you can just decree whatever you want and it will happen because you want it to happen. That, 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 that's a dangerous territory. My emotions can lie to me. I can't rely on my emotions. I have to rely on his word. And, and everywhere I see in his word, yes, I can speak some things to life. But I sometimes have to deal with some adversity in my life. But as long as he walks with me. Amen. As long as he is with me. Amen. I will fear no evil, right? Amen. Because the troubles are temporary. 
And so the post-exilic population found out firsthand that there were obstacles and difficult challenges awaiting for those who desire to rebuild their lives according to God's purpose. In other words, they were called to rebuild the temple because the temple was an expression or a manifestation uh, or a statement to the community that they valued God's presence more than anything else, right? The temple was the dwelling place of the living God. And so they had to begin a construction of a second house for God. And this became their main purpose once they return but they faced strong opposition in fact years after this passage that we're reading they had already started rebuilding but once they faced opposition and criticism from the people that were already in the land the scripture tells us that they stopped building for 17 years because of criticism because of judgment from the people in the land they felt intimidated. They felt that they didn't have what it take. And for 17 years, they went on a different route towards their purpose. 17 years they stopped building. Now who is the temple of the living God in our days? We're called to rebuild the temple, right? Yeah, right? To become a dwelling place. And sometimes we start really good, really solid. We read our Bible and then we get to a point like, man, I already read it all. I don't get it, right? Well, I go to church. I give. But there's not a burning desire to be who God calls you to be. And some Christians for years, for years... For years have neglected their purpose and their mission because of opposition, because criticism will come. The enemy will point fingers at you. Your enemies will point fingers at you. But it takes courage, like Zechariah had the courage to say, Let's maintain this. Let's keep this going. Let's keep building. Listen, this church right here, not in this building, but it used to be on Wall Street. It has been here since 1954. I've been pastoring this church for the last seven years. And we've never had opposition. No one has ever criticized us or me. takes courage. takes courage for you to stick around for the long haul. It's not easy. Sometimes the resources appear to not be there and then suddenly they come. Sometimes the people are not here. I'm like, what are we going to do, God? Why, why did you put me here? I didn't choose this, God. I trusted you with my list of priorities and this is what you gave me. But why is it not doing what I want it to do? <laughs> so since 1954, right? I, I want to challenge you. If you're of this house, I want to challenge you to keep building his house. Amen. <clears throat> and beyond the challenge, I want to encourage you to build his house. Listen, we need committed believers to local bodies. We are not the only church. We're not the best church. We are the only gathering church that we are. And we have a calling, a specific calling, a specific DNA, a set of gifts and talents. And you are part of the family, right? Amen. But some people hurt more the church, the global church, by Jumping from church to church and never committing and never serving, then just might as well just give up church, right? Amen. And some people help more the church by committing to a local church than trying to help everywhere when they can commit to one. But thankfully, thankfully, this, was, this is what brings me comfort, right? Thankfully, I'm not the one building his church. 
I'm not fully in charge. Jesus said, I will build my church. So whatever comes, whatever trial, whatever criticism, whatever judgment we have to go through, whatever misinterpretation we have to go through, I'm anchored with my Jesus. We are anchored to our Jesus. He is the rock. He is the foundation of everything we do. So I say, let's keep building, right? Let's keep building. Let's keep building. We are the church, not the building. We are the church. Let's keep building together. Peter says that we're like living stones coming together, building God's temple. Yes, it's important to have a personal relationship. Yes, you can sometimes say, well, it's between me and God. But most of the times, it's us and God. The people sees us, right, together. How will they know? Because of their love to one another, right? We come together. Let's keep building this thing. Amen. Let's keep being the church that God called us to be. Amen. Yes, yes. And so Zechariah has a set of eight visions. And from verse 1 through 14, we're giving the fifth vision. And the vision uh, during these verses is, is the reminder is not to seek after past glories because many people get stuck in the past. Well, it's not like it used to be. Well, do you remember that revival? Or they compared to other places and, and were pointing, and I wish I was there, and I wish we had that, and I wish we had, would have done that. And you, do you remember when the miracles did? And do you remember when the word, and do, do you remember the songs? And do you remember, and do you remember, do you, and all that shift of focus to the past or to other places makes us miss out on the glory that is here and now. On the fact that God's spirit is here and now. Because the truth of the matter is that God has been faithful to you here and now. You can point to the past, yes. You can point to other places, yes. But all of us can point to a here and now where God has been faithful. Even with trials, even with tribulations, God remains faithful. He is good, right? He is good in the mountaintop. He's good in the valley. He's good in the pain. He's good in the joy. He's good in the suffering. He's good in the great times in our lives. He is God and he is good, right? And so Zechariah says, you have to recognize the movement of God's spirit among you to equip you to rebuild the temple. See, the reason God's spirit is inside of you is not for you to just have fun with it. It's for you to keep building. 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 I wish I could go to the gym once and it would be effective through the whole year. That way I would just go January 1st of every year. Amen. Well, I tried it this year and it's not working. Yes, he sanctifies us when we receive him. Yes, he forgives us immediately. You are made new. Immediately you are given a new heart. Immediately he puts his spirit inside of you. But he's not going to leave you the way he found you. He wants to change you and make you more like him. In order for you to experience the fullness of his good desires for your life. And some have been given tasks in this life that are troublesome. But we still can trust him. We still can hope. In the fact that he's seated on the throne. And so Zechariah says. Don't be living in the past. Pay attention to the here. And now he's given you what you need to do. What you're supposed to do here. And now and so he begins. In verse number one. He says then the angel who talked with me. Returned and woke me up. This is after the fourth vision. Fifth vision. He kind of fell asleep. Because he probably was. Exhausted of so many visions. <clears throat> It's believed that the angel came and woke him up from a deep sleep. And he asked, he asked me, Zechariah says, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with the bowl at the top and seven lamps on it. With seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. One on the right of the bowl and the other one on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Now pay attention to the back and forth with the question. He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord. That's why I'm asking you what these are. <laughs> But he sees a bowl. Now, I try to find a, a, a decent 
picture of, of what we can read here. And, and I found some, but some are, are different because th this lamp doesn't look like Solomon's uh, lamps in, in, in his temple. He had like 10 of those with, with, with the, like a chandelier, like, like seven things coming up. You know, like a lamp. It, th this one looks different. This looks like it's a pole with a stand. And, and what, what, I, what I was telling the church this morning is, like, picture a big uh, tortilla. <laughs> Lift it up by seven. I'm, I'm hungry. Lift it up by seven, you know, by seven, like, fingers. And, and living, living like a curb on, on seven sides, right? And then some channels there that, that, that head the lights. Uh, are you kind of like, that? maybe that's something like, like, like what Zechariah saw. And, and that, that, that stand has oil in it right and he, and he channels to seven flames and he saw seven with seven so he saw 49 flames burning bright and and, and so he sees this gold lampstand and, and and not only the lampstand but he's, he's surrounded by by two olive trees and so the purpose of such lamp understand was to spread light around to illuminate a room I can think of Matthew 5.15 where Jesus says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the room. And so he sees 49 total flames. It was bright. That's what I'm trying to say. It was really, really bright. And so uh, verses 7 through 10 separates the lampstand vision and it's, interpretation and so all this is concerning this leader right the governor of Jerusalem Zerubbabel he's the community leader he's the one charged with the task of rebuilding the temple Haggai got them started Zerubbabel maintains them keeps them engaged In the mission and so they face difficult circumstances and, and the divine declaration to Zerubbabel begins with a promise aren't you thankful that when you go through tough times God reminds you who he is here's the promise on verse 6 he says he said to me this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord Almighty it promises that He will complete the task. It's saying, if you rely on me, you will. Like, you will succeed. This is a promise that will be fulfilled. But he also explains that he will not accomplish it on his own strength or in his own power, but by his spirit. Now, this is the misconception that we sometimes have. Okay, since it's by the spirit, I'm just going to sit down right here and wait for the spirit to do his magic. God, open the door. Open the door. Well, God says, well, you know, I'll give you the strength to stand up and go and open the door for yourself, right? <laughs> Zerubbabel is not, is not receiving a vision of like, oh, God will do it for us. No, he's saying, I will be empowered by the spirit of the living God to do what he's telling me to do. Because on my own strength and on my own power, it seems impossible. We don't even have the resources we need in order to accomplish such mission." And so in verse 7, it says, What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. And so in verse 7, the divine proclamation turns from promise to a description. It's a promise. You will do it not by your strength or your power, but by my spirit. Now let me tell you what it will look like. Like, if you allow me to work through you, this is what it will look like, right? In verse number eight, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel so verse 7 through 10 it's an ancient foundation for a ceremony uh, that, that implied uh, or it was like a ritual of, of the rebuilding of the temple and it was typically performed by the king 
And so Zerubbabel, in the vision, he's told he will place the capstone on the construction while the people pronounce blessings on it. It is finished. It is completed. But after a second promise that he will succeed with the Spirit's help, verse 10 describes another part of the foundation of the ceremony. It, it describes that, that he's holding an instrument in his hands for the people to see. And the purpose of this tool was to measure the temple walls for true alignments. It's not only finished, it's finished well. I'm not committing to follow Christ just half-heartedly. It's all or nothing. I want to be aligned. The reason he needed to be aligned is because it would be a statement to the community that they were doing things good for God because God deserved the best. It's one thing to say, I'm a Christian. It's one thing, it's a different thing to be a committed Christian, right? You have to demonstrate your alignment. You know why the world sometimes don't believe us anymore? Because we're not fully aligned. We say one thing, but we do another thing. We proclaim one thing, but we behave in a different way. We have to be aligned. We have to allow Christ to finish the work in our lives by constantly allowing him to align us to his will and his desires. I'm not saying you have to be perfect overnight. I'm just saying you have everything you, be, you need to be perfect today. Like what you know about God today is enough for you to live in all the light that you have been given. And the more you walk in the light that you have today, the more light he will give you to keep pursuing after his plans and desires for your lives. Alignment. Amen. It will not only measure the walls, it will have the effect of inspiring confidence in those who see them. They would fulfill their purpose. It would be a place where God's presence would dwell. How do people see God today in our world? In the clouds? No, that's just a reflection. In the mountains? No, that's a reflection of his glory. That's not. Where do people find God in our world, in our world today? The living God lives inside of us. Verse 10 ends with a reference to the seven eyes of the Lord, which mainly tells us that God is omnipresent, that he knows all things, that he not only is everywhere, but he's aware of everything and he knows all things. He's not concerned about the economy. He's not concerned about the resources. He's not concerned about coronavirus. He's not concerned about anything happening in this world. He's fully aware and fully in control. The question is, are we worshiping him constantly? Are we becoming day after day the temple where his presence can dwell? And so these people right here, they did not have the access or the kind of resources to build the kind of temple that Solomon built. But Zerubbabel tells them, you don't need to worry about that. You worry about today. Do not despise the days of small beginnings, of small things. <laughs> the economy of that region was very small. They, 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 it extended no further than 15 miles in any directions from Jerusalem. <laughs> they struggled because it was dry and there was a heavy taxation. <laughs> Yet in the eyes of the Lord, the project was worthy of rejoicing. Your journey is important. Your walk with God is important. Your gifts, your talents are valuable in God's eyes. He has equipped you with certain things to accomplish great things. Not according to the world's standards, but according to God's standards. And if God says that you're valuable, that you're chosen, that, that you're alive for a reason, that he has plans for you, guess what? You can rejoice. Yes. Yes. And so this project was worthy of rejoicing. 
Verse 11 through 14, then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? Don't you like the conversation? Like he asked twice, what are these? Again, let me ask again, what are these? And then he replies, do you not know what these are? No, I was just asking you twice, just. <laughs> See, I don't think this was written for Zechariah. I think this was written for us. Because sometimes, even though we laugh at the repeated questions, we act the very same way with God. Do you really, God really? <laughs> and then you hear it on the radio, yes, you should. And then you open your Bible and yes, you should. And then you come to church and yes, you should. Like I'm calling you. Hey, I want your heart. I have plans for you. I have the resources you need. I have the strength you need. I have the healing you need. I have the promises you need. I have the joy you need. I have the hope you need. I'm just not sure. He wondered if other details of the vision were important to understand in verse 14. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. He asks twice about the olive trees. If the team can start coming, please. Now the second time adds a detail. Because it says that the two gold pipes are connected to the lampstand. And this suggests that there is a constant flow of oil running between the two. They keep refilling the stand to keep the flame burning. As if the trees were providing an inexhaustible resource of oil for the lampstand. And so... The prophet's question was about what or who would supply this constant flow to the burning lamp. Now the angel never says, but it is reasonable to assume that the light of the lampstand symbolizes the testimony of God's temple to the world. How bright is your light? How bright is your flame? How constant is your flame? How are you maintaining your flame? Because it's easy to come and turn it on on Sunday, right? But everybody can start something. The goal is to maintain it. Amen. From this building that they were building, the people of God would become or could become a light For the Gentiles. So that salvation like Isaiah 49, 6 says. So that salvation may reach the ends of the earth. The olive trees giving oil to the lambs. Symbolize the resources that God provides. To maintain the divine presence in the temple. Listen, sometimes as Christians we become so mystic in in our pursuit of God. And we try to make everything about our senses and about our emotions. But what if you could rejoice even on the smallest things that God has provided for you? Because the truth of the matter is, everyone in this room this morning is wearing shoes. We're clothed. Most of us were not cold last night. A job, money, much or little in the bank. Food on our table. But keep, we keep wanting to feel something when maybe I could just be thankful that I can sit on a cushioned chair on Sunday morning and enjoy God's presence. Amen. The olive trees giving oil to the lamp symbolize the resources that God provides 
to maintain the divine presence in the temple what you have been given in is not just so that you can enjoy it is so that you can maintain God's presence in this temple but why do we complain about the opposition where well, we can be grateful about the blessing and maintain God's presence in our soul right and remain in God's presence Zechariah's vision of the lampstand in the rebuilt temple emphasizes that the defining element, listen to me, the defining element of the life of God's people is not their political leaders or military power, but their worship in God's presence. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Your worship keeps you focused. Worship keeps you burning for God's presence. Worship, regardless of the circumstances, will keep your flame going. And so the Israelites had returned from exile, right? Here's what you need to know. Despite their hopes for a restored kingdom and temple, never materialized. They never happened. Zechariah's vision painted a beautiful picture of a restore temple and lit the world with the presence of God but this vision did not fully come to fruition before the closing of the last chapter of the last book in the Old Testament despite their return home in some sense the Israelites still lived in exile <laughs> the picture of people living in exile at home is still relevant to us today we are part of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Embodying the light of the presence of God in a dark world. It's dark. And Zechariah's vision was concerned on multiple levels. It pointed to the temple that Zerubbabel would complete. But it would also speak about the coming Messiah and, and the people of God living today. And ultimately to the final establishment of God's kingdom where according to Revelation 22 5 they will not need the light of a lamb or the light of the Sun for the Lord God will give them light would you stand up yeah. Our job is to keep that flame alive until His return. I believe God has placed us in this community to bring people to the knowledge of who He is. But our programs won't do it. Anybody can pack a place with good entertainment. I want God's presence to dwell in this place. We want to see people being healed, being delivered, being restored, being given purpose. We are all about experiencing God, about finding community, about fulfilling our purpose. All those principles become nothing if God is not in it, right? I want you to consider areas in your life where resources may seem insufficient in order for you to accomplish what you know you're supposed to accomplish. And now be reminded that God promises to give you what you need. The strength, the resilience, right? The courage. The lamps needed a continual source of fuel to keep burning. What are you going to do to keep your flame burning? The lamps represented God's presence in the world. And in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He said, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven how do people around us experience the presence of God through our lives 
it comes down whether you have light or not. And in order to have light, you need the oil. I want the oil. I want his presence to dwell in me. I want his presence to dwell in our midst. I want him involved in everything we do, in everything we say, in everything we plan, in everything we dream. Listen, sometimes we need resources. God provides the resources. But every single time, he provides those through us. And I don't know about you, but I can wait to continue to be used by God. To bring people to the knowledge of who he is. Would you close your eyes? I want you to listen to this prayer. And then after we pray, I want you to sing as loud as you can about God's goodness. This is our prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your provision. We cannot do the work of your kingdom in our own strength. So Lord, my prayer is that you give us eyes to see as you do the small things that will show your presence to the world as we stay faithful. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Help us to keep encouraging one another. In Jesus' name, and the church says, Amen. I'll give God praise and sing as loud as you can.